So this information is based on two sets of standards, the International Building Code, which is the building code which governs practice within the U.S. and several other countries, and then also the North Carolina Building Code. So a state code can never be less stringent than the International Building Code, but sometimes it can be more stringent. Our North Carolina Building Code, by and large, runs pretty parallel to the International Building Code. It, the Building Code addresses all sorts of issues, including fire safety, and that's really what we want to talk about with regard to fire stairs. This is a basic diagram that I find really useful to explain the fire stair exiting principles. So the idea is that from anywhere in the building, you should be able to have two different paths to a safe way to exit the building. And so on a one-story building, pretty much what that means is there are at least two doors that go to the exterior. But when we have a multi-story building, we really need to start incorporating stairs that are of a different sort. We can have a monumental stair in a building and that can be open and more ornamental in its qualities and have sort of open space. But a fire stair has really particular requirements. It has to be fire rated so that it is a safe space. If there's a fire burning in part of the building, the fire stair needs to be able to basically resist the fire for several hours in order for the people in the building to be able to, to exit. And as you can imagine, the taller a building gets, the more occupants it has, and therefore the mo more fire stairs that it has. Typically when you're talking about an occupancy under 500, you would have two sets of stairs located remote from each other. And that is the idea that for a person who is in a room, they need to have two different ways to get out. So you don't want two fire stairs very near each other because if you had the fire in one area, both of the stairs are gonna be inaccessible. So the presumption is that if one of the fire stairs is blocked by the fire itself, that the occupants could go to the other fire stair. You'll need to complete your building codes reviews to determine your occupancy, but as the occupancy increases, you will need to provide more fire stairs. From 500 to 1,000, you will need three fire stairs, and above 1,000, you'll need four fire stairs. So really, from any space, the occupant should be able to leave the room, wherever they are, and travel in one of two different directions, one way to go to one set of fire stairs and the other to go to another. But there are several sort of parts of this discharge system. So we always talk about the fire stair, but there are other components that you want to be aware of. The first place that you might find yourself, the most remote condition within the building is considered to be the room. So you cannot pass from one room through another room in order to get to the fire stair. You can only pass from one level of the system to a safer level of the system. So you've got the room, which is considered the most remote. From the room, you need to be able to get to what's considered to be an exit access corridor. So some kind of a circulation space that will lead you to the third level of safety, and that is the fire stair. So the fire stair is actually sort of the third in line. Once you've passed through each of these levels into the fire stair, the, the assumption is that you will travel down to what is called the exit discharge. And what that means is from the stair, you could possibly be exiting through another corridor or through another sort of connective space. And that could be even a service alley. It doesn't necessarily have to be something that's on the interior of the building. The fifth level is the public way. So the public way, think at that point you are actually sort of safe in the space where everybody else is. So the street, a sidewalk, um, a site, for example, all of those things would be considered the public way. If you have to build in some other elements, if your fire stair is at all isolated within the body of the building, you may need to create an exit discharge, which is at least as fire resistive, if not more fire resistive than the fire stair. So again, the room, the corridor, the exit stair, the discharge space, which again can be interior or exterior, and then the public way. So those are the kind of components that you want to think about. You also want to think about this idea of where are you going to have two exits. So if you have any opportunity to exit at grade, that can be considered one of your means of exit. For example, if this was a second story space and I had one fire stair 
and an exit at grade, which was something like exiting to the light rail platform. So the light rail platform could be a public way in that case. So if I can exit directly outside, that can be one of my means of egress. But you can exit at grade, that's one possible scenario. You can exit through fire stairs. So you can see here, again, we have the exit stairway and then the discharge to the, the safe right of way. But you can also exit through a second building. So you could actually pass through a fire resistive construction to a second structure if it had a fire stair. So same kind of requirements. You can't go back into rooms, but you can stay in resistive corridors in order to get to the stairs. Things to know about the fire stair. This looks a little different. I mean, normally we are sort of swinging the door in, but if you think about it, when you swing a door into the space, if you have a lot of people running around the stair, you've suddenly created a kind of hazard. If you swing a door and you you hit somebody and they are now unconscious laying in the fire stair that's a very bad scenario so the idea is either to have a sufficient depth on the landing so that the door does not swing into the path of travel or to have a kind of almost second small corridor space where the door can swing safely and all of the people who are traveling around the stair are able to keep traveling safely but at a minimum, depending on the occupancy of your building, you're gonna have a minimum width that exists here as sort of one run of stairs. And the width would be the same as the landing. If your width is required to be five feet, your landing is required to be five feet. And this again is set by the number of people that are expected to use your stair, which you can imagine has to do with your occupancy and the number of floors. What you're gonna to wanna to look for is for your given uh, height and occupancy, what is that W dimension? We'll talk about that in a minute. You also want to make sure that your stairs are far enough apart. So you can see if this was the, the sort of large rectangular building, you can see an instance in which there are two fire stairs, they're not by the exterior. And you can imagine this might happen quite a bit in things like apartment buildings where you have apartments all the way around, you know, or even high rise office towers where you have the stairs closer to the middle than an edge. So the dimension that you wanna look for is uh, a remoteness, exit remoteness. How far away from each other do the exits need to be? And so that applies to both the overall building as well as the room. So let's go back and talk about that a minute. So if we have an overall building, what we wanna do is find our longest diagonal dimension, and that's our capital D. The fire stairs from door to door need to be a minimum of half of the D dimension. They can be longer, they can be farther apart, but they cannot be closer together. So if you took your D dimension and split it in half, that's the dimension between the two fire stairs. Now that is the number if you have a building that is not sprinklered. Most public buildings are going to be sprinklered. So the good news is that this dimension for a sprinklered building can be split into three rather than two, which means that your fire stairs can be a little bit closer together. So that's great, right? That can be very convenient if possible. But remember, when you get to the bottom of the fire stair, you still have to have a protected corridor that leads you to the outside of the building. Okay, so that applies to the building as a whole from fire stair to fire stair. But rooms also have requirements for exits. And if you have a room of under 50 people, then you only need one door out of that space. But if you had a large room and you anticipated more than 50, the rule is that you need to have two doors out of that space. And the same kind of uh, quality of remoteness is important in a room. So you wouldn't want two doors right next to each other because if the fire is right in front of them, then that's not more safe. So same thing, you would take the dimension of the diagonal across the room and that's your D for the room. And again, for a non-sprinklered building, you would split that in half and your doors have to be at least that far apart. For a sprinklered building, you would split it in thirds and your doors have to be at least that far apart. Okay, but again, that only applies to large occupancy rooms. The other characteristic of fire stairs is called the maximum travel distance to the exit. And what that means is from a door, to a stair, there is one number, the travel distance from the nearest exit to the door of the room. So every door that is closest to this stair has to meet this maximum travel distance requirement. But there's also a maximum travel distance requirement 
inside of the room. So if you had a really long, narrow room, you would take the farthest point in the room and you would measure the longest travel path to the stair. And there's also a, a travel distance for that. And again, when I am saying there's a travel distance and not giving you a number, it's because that distance depends on the type of project that you're building. An office building, um, it would be different than it would be for a school. Another issue with regard to the location of a fire stair is corridors that exist beyond the fire stair. So imagine that your, your fire stair is set here. Everything beyond this is considered to be somewhat hazardous. Imagine if someone ran by, missed the fire stair, and ran down here. If this corridor is very long and they ran to the end before they realized that they weren't going to have a safe way out, that's very dangerous. So there are limits to the length of corridor that can be beyond the fire stair. So in this case, this is a, just a dead end corridor, right? Here we don't have any distance in the corridor, but this is basically a corridor that I can run down and get stuck. So we don't want these dead end corridors and typically that's 50 feet, but it does again vary with project type. And here's what I mean by this. So in the egress system, you're gonna go to the building codes and there are different kinds of occupancies that um, have different requirements. So maximum travel distances, maximum common path of egress, largest room that can have only one opening, uh, minimum dead end corridors, etc. So you can see all of these different minimums apply to different kinds of buildings. We also need to look at the door swings in a corridor. All of your doors need to swing out. That's the first rule. Every door except for a storage space and a bathroom or a private office needs to swing out. So if you're swinging this door out and people are running toward the exit and you just clock someone on the head, again, problematic. So we'd much rather have sort of doors that are set in to a part of the corridor where we're not, you know, if we have a sort of emergency and people are running down here, um, we want those doors to be sort of in a space where we're not going to impede the flow of traffic. Door swing may not obstruct more than half of the required width of the exit access corridor. So um, problematic, but still as long as we have width, we can swing the door in that way. The last diagram deals with some of the widths for the portions of the egress system that we've been talking about in the abstract. The first thing you need to do is calculate the occupancy for your building. What the building code asks you to do is to understand the number of occupants that are either in a given space or on a given floor or in a given building. And based on those numbers, there are multipliers that will help you to determine the correct widths of the elements. For the example, let's assume that we have under 500 occupants, which allows us to have two fire stairs. In bigger projects, you would have more. So when we get up beyond 500 people in the building, between 500 and 1,000, we would have three exits. And when we get above that, we would have four exits and so on. Those, again, could be exits at grade, they could be fire stairs, or they could be exits between one fire protected building and another. So it also is going to influence our the dimensions of our doorways, corridors, and ramps as well. So we know that we're going to be a sprinklered building. We would have to make them wider in a non-sprinklered building. But for a sprinklered building, in North Carolina Building Code, we need 0.2 inches per occupant for the minimum width of our doorways, corridors, and ramps. So when you think about that for a minute, if a doorway is the same width as a corridor, that's a really big doorway. So clearly when they're talking about doorways, they're talking about doorways to spaces. Uh, but they could be talking about doorways that exit from the building as a ho whole. And this is why you'll see at the main entrances of buildings, multiple doors, because those multiple doors are allowing multiple people, the large number of occupants to leave. So you always have more doors at the entry. But for a single room, even you would use the same multiplier. So, and for stairs, it's even wider. We need wider stairs because of the sort of paths of travel to be safe. So for each occupant using the stair, we need 0.3 inches. The multipliers would tell you an approximate width, and again, that's a kind of minimum. So there's a minimum be below which you cannot go, but there's also a minimum for your project. So just as an example, if we were in a one-story building and we had 500 occupants, so this blue line is right at that 500 number, and we knew that we had a multiplier of 0.2 or 0.3. So 0.2 is here if we dropped down 
we would see that we would need 100 inches of corridor space, ramp space, or doorway space at a minimum. So, you know, if they're 36 inch doors, that's at least three doors leaving that space. But you are not designing a one story building, so you'll need to calculate your occupancy floor by floor. Let's say that our calculation indicated that we needed 120 inches of stair width. That 120, which is about 10 feet, is split between two stairs. So that's about a five foot tread width for each of the two fire stairs. And I think that's a really good number. For me, that's about the minimum that I would put in a public building under any circumstances. But if we went to a three story building, for example, and we had maybe 200 people on each floor, the stair width would be 60. If we drop down, the corridor width would be 42. So if we split that 60 inches into two fire stairs, you can see that that is less than a minimum safe stair. So again, I would say for a public building, I would never use less than a five foot wide tread.